Welcome in everybody to the flagship podcast interview. I am Chip Brown of Horns247.com. Very excited to be joined today by Jackson Jeff Coat, Ted Hendricks Award winners, uh, college football's top defensive end in 2013 for the University of Texas and current Gray Cup winner with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Jackson, thanks so much for uh, for joining us, man. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's always great to be back here in Austin and at home. I uh, got a couple of weeks until I got to head back up to Canada, so I'm enjoying my time. Yeah, I bumped into you. Um, we were at Steve Sarkeesian's press conference uh, leading up to the spring game on Thursday, and uh, I was so excited to catch up with you because you got a lot going on. I mean, we'll we'll get into all of your your football, but you're also doing commercial real estate here in Austin, um, and it kind of ties back to a former Dallas Cowboy. Tell us about what's going on with you. For sure. So I'm working with Cantera Real Estate Group out here in Austin um, with uh, Whit Westbrook and Bo Ricks. Those are two of my partners um, down here in Austin, and we are our parent company is. Rubicon representation out of Dallas. Um, and the way I got kind of set up with the the gig was my dad had got talking to Chad Hennings, who's an, who's a partner with Rubicon. And he told me like, Hey, like I know Jackson's looking for a commercial real estate job to be a, an agent. Like we would love to have him work with us in Austin. And I told my dad, I was like, Hey, I'm still playing ball. Like I, I probably got like a year to two more years left playing like dude like tell chad that let him know and he told me he came back and said hey that's fine like we want you for the long run we want you here so like come get with us go play ball when you're done get the ground running but we want you to learn the business and then so when you're ready to go like we can really get stuff picked up of course for people who if you've been in a cave um Jackson's dad, Jim Jeff Coat, of course, played uh, with the Dallas Cowboys, played with the Buffalo Bills, played with Chad Hennings um, with the Dallas Cowboys. And and Chad Hennings knows about having to to wait a little before, you know, getting on to his career, right? As a as an Air Force guy, had to finish his time uh, serving with the Air Force before he got to play with the Cowboys. But you've he's been a family friend of yours. For sure, for sure. It's uh it's it's funny because he was reminding me we had uh lunch a couple weeks ago here. We used to do Bible studies at his house. So the family would come over and we'd do our Bible study at his house. And that's really how we became very close with the Hennings. That's uh that's cool. How's your dad doing, by the way? He's doing well. He's doing well. He's up in Dallas, uh Frisco to be exact, where he's doing an insurance. Um Maybe a coaching job will be coming his way soon. We'll see. But uh, right now he's doing uh, insurance. He works for a company called BBI Solutions, and he has, like, all your insurance needs. So he's enjoying it. He's doing really well. Uh, well it's funny yeah. because I covered your dad as a player with the Dallas Cowboys, and then I covered him as a coach with the Dallas Cowboys when I covered the uh, the Cowboys for the Dallas Morning News in, in um, the early 2000s. And, For sure. and your dad, uh, you know, awesome, awesome guy, awesome player. But let's let's talk about Jackson Jeffco because, you know, people, if they're you know not watching closely uh, in the Canadian Football League, you have been wrecking shop up there. And we'll get to, you know, you winning the Grey Cup and bringing the Grey Cup back to Austin, and even bringing it by uh, Steve Sarkeesian to take a look at because he he. Yes, sir you know, had some time in the, in the CFL as well, but take us through the journey, Jackson, because, you know, you're all American, you're in 2013, big year. And, and then you don't get drafted in 2014, no Longhorn does. And that was, you know, take us through that moment. And then you do get time in the NFL. For you sure. Tony Romo for crying out loud. <laughs> um, but take us through, you know, 2013 and, and, and the journey. For sure. For sure. I hope you guys got time. I, oh yeah. We got time, baby. It's, it's going to be a little bit of a story, but 
starting off with getting drafted or not getting drafted, I was hurt. I was frustrated. I was upset. I was I I lost a lot of confidence. And for me, looking back, that was a huge lesson for me. All the work that I put in and grinded just to get to that point and the things that I sacrificed, I thought it was all for naught. I thought it was not important anymore. I thought like because I put that work in and it didn't happen, it didn't carry over, but it did. I mean, I really had to learn how to kind of get my swagger back, get become like who I knew I was and learn that like people are just going to want to put you down. That's just what they want to do. They're going to kind of try to put you down. They're going to try to tell you you're something that you're not. And I had to really figure out who Jackson Jeffco was. And I think this was the best thing for me. So as crazy as it sounds, I'm happy that it, that everything happened the way it did, that I didn't get drafted, that I was able to like start as an undrafted guy and make my way up and make the roster at uh, Washington and then go through injuries and go through highs and lows there and figure out that like, is football something I really want to do? Do I want to, do I want to move on and go do some real estate? Because in between um, 2006 or from 2015 to 2017, like 16, 2016, I didn't play that whole year, that whole season. And so I, I interned with the Lincoln Property Company in Dallas. I was living there. And that's kind of how I got introduced to the real estate game. And you see it's come a long way from there. But, yeah, so I get an opportunity. One of my coaches told me his name is Master Joe Kim. He said, hey, go to the CFL. You just need film. Keep getting film. You're better off getting film than not playing and um, just sitting around. So I went to the CFL. And to me, it's a pass rusher's dream. My first year, I had a really good season for a rookie. It was a lot of fun. It was There was a lot of adjustment. And then my second year was great. I just got injured. And then I think it was my third. Uh, I got – I might have got it. I can't remember. But third year was great. I think I got an injury, came back. We, we won the Great Cup for first 2019. Then this last season, my fourth season, healthy the whole year, had my best season yet, um, and we win it again. It was incredible. And I, through this process, I just learned, like, I always used to think I worked hard. I was like, man, you work hard. You're a hard worker. You're this and that. When I, when, as I got older, I wasn't working hard. Not hard enough. I was kind of – resting on my athletic abilities, my talents. And I worked hard, but not hard enough. And I always would watch how my dad would do things, even when he was playing. And I was like, I got to get to that. But then I realized I got to be better than that if I want to be who I want to be. So I started falling in love with the grind, falling in love with things being hard, struggling, getting with like Tim Crowder, working with him on the field, because he's amazing for like getting you ready for the season and kind of being like a mental coach as well. Training with uh, my, I trained with Jeremy Hills. I'm training with a guy named Aaron Rosa right now. Really good at, with speed work and all that and just getting the best out of me. I started figuring out the best things for me. I do meal prep, just figuring out what, what works best for me. And I think that's helped me to get where I am now is being a two-time Grey Cup champ and going for the third one. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... And you, I mean, was the CFL on your radar? Um, like, would you have come to that if if you hadn't been, you know, gotten that tip from, you know, from your friend? Yeah, I don't know if I would have. Uh, I've not heard of him. I, I heard of the CFL. I knew John Harris, who was playing in the CFL before I got there. He was at Ottawa, and they actually won the Great Cup that year. Uh, so I hit him up about it and talked to him and he liked it and he loved it. And so he kind of helped with like being like, okay, I'll make the transition. I'll go up there. I'll go play. Uh, but before, yeah, I didn't really know. I'd see John post things about being in Canada and being on, on uh, the red blacks. But other than that, I didn't know a lot. And that's, that's one of my problems that I have with the CFL at the moment. They don't do a good job of getting, 
their content down here because we have such a long period of time that we play from May. Our training camp's in May. We start June. We play until November. There's a lot of time there that there's no football being played. So why not? Why can't Americans watch? We love football here. So we want to watch football. So why not take advantage of that time? And get it on TV down here. Like that, I I know we played on ESPN and ESPN two here before, but like no one really knows. They got to shoot it everywhere. I was gonna say because I watched Canadian football growing up on ESPN, and yeah, it was all during the summer. It was great. You know, you always want to be able to get your football fix. Um, so yeah, we got to get uh, we got to get the exposure up. But you you talked about you know leaving Texas. What was you you went to camp with Seattle? Went to Seattle. Um, Pete Carroll, tell us about that experience before For you sure. went on to Washington. Man, when I went to Seattle, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Um, I went I went to Texas to play, but USC was one of my top teams that I wanted to go to. Pete Carroll was there. Ken Norton was there at, and he was at Seattle as well. So that was a big, that was cool for me. It was exciting to go and play for these guys and learn, learn like what made USC or what made their system special. And I saw it. I saw it. It, it was, it's very special. It's, they have a lot of fun, but they work really, really hard. And they need guys, they want guys that are versatile. For me, and I realized this because I all I can take an ownership for is myself. And so I came in at this Leo position that was more comfortable for me. It's like a hybrid defensive end. I drop a little bit, but I'm still playing D-line. And I loved it. I was comfortable with it. It was something that was nice. Well, right after mid OTAs and minicamp, they come to me and say, hey, we're going to move you to outside linebacker. Where you're going to play the same position as um, Bruce Irvin. And Michael Morgan, Mike Mo, um, and I'm like, what? I'm moving to linebacker, and uh, yeah, and so I tried to learn the plays. I didn't understand much about coverage like that at all because we didn't we didn't do a lot of drops in coverage uh, at Texas. We did some, but not a lot. So I had to go and learn coverage. I had to learn every, a whole new position during training camp. It, my head was spinning. I was not able to showcase the best, like my best talent. Like knowing now, if I was put in that position, I'd be fine. Because I I've under, I understand how to do it. I understand coverages and whatnot. But but you were having to learn it on the fly. In on the fly. Set and I was time. not picking it up. And so they're, what they're saying is this guy is not versatile. He can't pick up something else. He's only tied into this position. He can't do anything else. And I failed in that, that situation. To me, I failed in that situation. I wasn't able to pick it up. It was so new to me. It was foreign. And I just didn't, I just didn't get it right. Now, at that time, I was so frustrated when I got cut. Like the reason, probably the biggest reason I got cut, and like it's so frustrating that it happened, but we were lining up and on a for a play, and I lined up on the wrong side. Just because I'm like looking at everything and I'm not, I'm seeing too much. Uh, and I line up on the wrong side. And after that, I don't go into the, it's his third preseason game. I don't go into the game anymore. And like, I could see the writing on the wall. They were pissed. Like, I know when, when they cut me, uh, Pete Carroll told me like, if you want to play in this league, you got to be able to play linebacker. And I was like, okay, well, I'll be able to play linebacker. Next time you see me, don't worry. And then, I, I don't like nose. I don't like nose. I don't like getting cut. It's happened plenty of times. But uh, I wasn't going to let this – something else tear me back down. I was already – I was on my way up. I was trying to come back up. So after that, I get cut. I go to work out at Jacksonville. They don't sign anybody or not me. Then I go work out at Washington with the Redskins, now the commanders. Um and they said that I killed the workout and they wanted to bring me on. They're going to play me at outside backer. 
same as Brian Arakpo. So I get to play with like Big Bro and play with Ryan Kerrigan and then play with some guys I watched at the Cowboys, like Jason Hatcher. I mean, it was a pretty cool situation for me to go in there and play. And so I was playing outside backer, which was a little more like the defensive end position I played at uh, at Texas. So it was a little more – it's actually a lot more uh, comfortable for me. And I was playing backer. I was able to drop. I know how to drop. I can drop. You just got to teach me what the coverage. You got to teach me what I have to see with the coverage, where I got to be inside if I have to be inside at number two, if I need to wall him, if I need to man-to-man him. Like what? That's all I needed to know. And I, I just didn't learn that when I was in Seattle. So I learned it. And I think I could have stuck there. But they were always bringing in new guys. Somebody knew. They brought in Preston Smith. So they got rid of Brian Arakpo. Uh, and had Ryan Kerrigan, Trent Murphy, who was in my class, they drafted him. And then Preston Smith. Uh, the, Preston Smith, Ryan Kerrigan, Trent Murphy. That's three DNs that they have that they like. And I was the fourth one, the guy that comes in on like sp- pass for situations and whatnot. I, I, it just, I could see it again, right on the wall. They're slowly trying to push me out, just I'm becoming a special teams guy. Um, and so I ended up, I got injured. And after that, I, I just kind of, I kind of knew. They acted like I, I was coming back, but I kind of knew. So they, they cut me. I had to get a back surgery and that picked up by Cleveland. Um, when I went to Cleveland, I was excited to be there because they had all these new facilities, all this new coach. Uh, it, it, it was going to be exciting. It was an exciting time. I had done well in like the mini camp and whatnot. And during training, I didn't tell them this, but during training, I like hurt my hip and like it, it affected my running. They told us we we're going to have 40 forties for conditioning. 40. So I had been practicing them and I was in good shape. And we get back there and they're like, okay, we got 10. I'm like, oh, perfect. It doesn't matter if I'm hurting. I can still run 10. So we warming up my hip and back are like hurting. I'm like, oh, it does not feel right. So we run, we get, we're running 40s. I'm doing okay. We get to like six. I start feeling like a twinge in my hamstring. I'm like, what's going on? We're running seven. I'm like, oh man, I got to slow down a little bit. I run eight. I'm like, we just got three. I got eight, nine, and ten, and we're done. The eighth one, I feel my hands just go. Pow. I had to stop. And they're like, what happened? Like, have you been working out? I was like, yeah, I've been working out hard, and it's so frustrating because I can't. I didn't want to tell them like I hurt my hip during during uh, training, and so it just. I was on the IR list. Another guy got hurt, or a couple guys. Hey, no, a couple guys got hurt, and um, they had to release me. They had to bring other guys in. Well, so. this this is where the story turns. We'll take a quick break with Jackson Jeffcoat here on the flagship podcast interview. Uh, and if you're watching us on the the Horns twenty four seven YouTube channel, we'll roll along. And so, Jackson, you get the 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 tip to to go to the CFL. You signed with Winnipeg in 2017, and as you said, build it up, build it up. 2019, you win the Grey Cup. You win it again in 2021. What the comfortability in the game and being on a team where they believe in you and the coaches are counting on you, how was that experience compared to what you were experiencing in the NFL? It, it was it was just a night and day difference. It was special. Like when I came in, yeah, they played around. It felt a little bit similar to like the NFL at one point in time, just because of we weren't the team and program that we are now at in Winnipeg when I first got there. And a couple guys had to leave. A couple guys we had to bring in a couple more guys, and that really helped develop the culture that we have. Um, it just, but it feels amazing. It feels amazing to be wanted. It feels amazing to be seen as a leader for the team. It feels amazing to have the respect of coaches, but also your your peers and your teammates. Um, it's been a lot of fun. And I'm always trying to learn and try to figure out like better ways to help my teammates to be their best. 
it's just it's 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 what I thought the NFL was gonna be like for me. It's what I thought it was gonna be like. I thought I was gonna make a lot of friends in the NFL. Someone's like, you're not gonna make any friends in it. My dad told me like, you're not there to make friends, which I was like, no, I'm not there to make friends. But you think you'd make some accidentally or whatever on the way, right? But no, I did. I I made a couple of friends there, but in CFL, like I, our team is really close, close knit. Those are my brothers, and it's been a lot of fun. Um, well, when you, when you, I mean, this year nine sacks or the twenty twenty one season, your Grey Cup second Grey Cup winning season, nine sacks, um, four forced fumbles. Uh, you're a CFL All Star, and and you know getting the does everyone you you got to bring the Grey Cup to Austin, and I don't know if this is a Canadian thing where the Stanley Cup the hockey players each get a day with the cup. Is that how it is with the Grey Cup? It's like that in Canada, but they don't normally get bring it here to the states. Um, the biggest thing I Willie Jefferson and I talked to our our uh, our guys at Winnipeg and said that hey, look, you bring the cup down here, there's a strong chance we'll come back. Uh, let us like let us take the cup around Texas. Let us enjoy. Uh, let us enjoy like showing it. And actually, it ended up working really well for the CFL because it gained exposure down here. I mean, I went to UT. They posted it on their Instagram, their Twitter. People are like, "What's the Great Cup? Oh, that's the Great. Oh, Jackson Jekyll's been playing in Canada. That's amazing. I didn't know that. Very cool." And it just it, it helped with exposure. Team people are hitting me up like, "Hey, I'm gonna watch the um, I'm gonna watch the season this year. I'm gonna check you guys out. I'll watch the CFL. I need some football there in May, June, July, August. I need some." Heck yeah! I mean, come on, let's go. Now let me ask you this, Jackson. You took it. Um, you brought the the Grey Cup to Austin. There's a great picture of you and Steve Sarkeesian. Steve Sarkeesian, you know, was in the CFL for a minute, I think. What, you know, I'm sure you guys have talked about his time in the CFL. What, what, uh, what was that conversation like? It was just good to talk. He played at our, 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 one of our rivals, actually our ri biggest rivals, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Um, and he was saying it was very cold up there. Uh, it's just, I, I think it's a fun league for a quarterback, just like it's a fun league for a defensive end. Um, he enjoyed it. He was just telling me kind of stories about just being out there, the differences, what he noticed. Cause I, I'm pretty sure he like, he played and played against Winnipeg. He played against all these other teams and was able to get, get a chance to, to see other places. And he enjoyed it. He said he, he liked Canada. Canada is cool. I don't know if he was up there for super long, but like it, we, we also talked about his career or him playing at BYU and, how he enjoyed that. It was just fun to talk. And he asked me a lot of questions about Winnipeg in general. He said, uh, I told him, like, you're not going to get in trouble for taking a picture of the Grey Cup. He's like, I wasn't in Sask long enough to <laughs> for them to really care. <laughs> well, now, wasn't Vince Young signed by the Saskatchewan Rough Riders? He was there. Vince was there. Um, I, I can't remember what year it was, but I was, like, super excited to go against Vince. I really wanted to play Vince really bad just because he likes to talk a lot of smack and we used to talk smack when I was at UT. Uh, I mean, we still do when we see each other, but we talk, we talk smack whenever we see each other. I love it. I love it. What uh, now you, you grew up in Plano, Plano West high school, five-star recruit. What the heck was it like for you being in Canada where it is bitter cold? You and I were talking a little bit, uh, before the interview and you were talking about like, I mean, how cold have, has it gotten when, you know, you've either been practicing or, or playing? Well, you, you gotta, remember, I lived in Buffalo, New York for a little bit. So that as a kid, so I think that's what kind of helped me with my love for like snow and cold weather. I think because I enjoy the cold. I enjoy it because like it's the perfect weather for me to play football in. Perfect weather for me, but it's so cold. Like if I'm not playing, like it's a, it's it's you gotta wear layers. You gotta like we we had a practice that was like minus twelve degrees. 
It was cold. Now yeah, I'm talking about like that you were putting your hand on the ground and getting frostbite. Yep, I got frostbite on my finger, on my middle finger. <laughs> and you won't wear sleeves during games. No, I don't wear sleeves unless it's like bitter cold. Actually, um, there's only been like two games that I felt cold during the game, and that was the uh, our Western final against the the Rough Riders this year. It was actually cold. It was really cold. Um, and my second year or first year, no, my second year in Winnipeg, we played in Calgary and it was freezing. And I actually had sleeves on that game. I actually wore sleeves. But no, not very – I don't wear sleeves. I just – you guys see, saw me when I played against Baylor. It was supposed to be – it was like a 22 degrees freezing rain game, no sleeves. I don't know. It's just – Feels better as long as my my chest and everything is warm. I'm fine. Yeah, your final season. Well, before that, you when you brought the Grey Cup down to Austin, uh, did I read somewhere where you were eating chips and queso out of it? Yeah, I had I uh, I had chips and queso out of it. I put the bowl in there. I didn't eat it actually out yeah. of the actual. Uh, I got you. Cup, but I put the bowl in there and I I ate it out. It was nice. That's awesome. It's That's a awesome. Texas thing. Had to keep oh, yeah. it. <laughs> so your last season at Texas was was 2013. It was a very successful year for you personally. And and you you all, as you mentioned, you were playing Baylor for a share of the Big 12 title. It was a it was a really weird season because I think Manny Diaz got let go like after yeah. the BYU game and Greg Robinson came in. What, what do you remember about that 2013 season most? It was just like we really fought adversity. Like it started off tough and guys were like, guys still believed. We still believed that we could get things done. It was hard when Manny, Coach Diaz was, was gone, but we bring in Coach Robinson and like he picked up where he left and just took off. Like he, he his the, I guess he was watching us a lot, so his defense really fit us really well. And so it was incredible to play in that defense. I think that the defense really helped me to learn more about league ball. I mean, Coach Diaz made sure that we knew the X's and O's too. Like he did a really good job of making sure we were quizzed on like blocking schemes, personnels, all that, like even before Coach Robinson got there. So – it's it was tough to see him go for sure, but then when Coach Robinson came in, I think uh, his style, his defense, really fit us really well. It was fun. Uh you know, we had that six game win streak. We lost to Oklahoma State. If we would have beat them, we would have won the Big Twelve. It didn't matter what we did against Baylor. If we would have beat Oklahoma State, we won the Big Twelve. And I always look back at that game. That's one game that I'm like, we just needed to get them. We couldn't get them, but. That's how it happens. It, it was a fun year. People don't realize that. Mac Brown got let go on a year that he we could have been Big 12 champs. Yeah. I mean, it was crazy. Um, and I, I was talking to you about that OU game because Oklahoma, you know, y'all had been struggling. Oklahoma came into that game thinking they were going to be y'all's pallbearers at Mac Brown's funeral. And you all – just lit them up. You were the more physical team. Uh, the offense ran it down Oklahoma's throats, the defense. I mean, this was not even a, a close game. You all dominated them. What do you remember about that game? Man, that game just, we were hyped up from the get-go. And I, like I said to you earlier, that was not a game that I was going to let us lose if I had anything to say about it. I mean, I had been, been beaten at home in Dallas three times. I was not going to get skunked at home. Like I couldn't take, how, how am I going to go back to my city? And I, I'm just getting beat by Oklahoma. And they're like, well, you lost Oklahoma every time. Cause my sister went to Oklahoma. So like we, we knew people that were at Oklahoma and they talked a lot of mess about it. And I'm like, well, you can't have beat us. You haven't did this. I was like, man, senior year, this is what counts. All them guys that went to Oklahoma, they're not my class. Senior year is what counts. Y'all can talk all y'all want about the other three years. The senior year is what counts. How'd you finish? 
And so we had to go out with a bang. And offense came out firing. Defense was hyped. We uh, we had a really good game plan for them, and uh, we executed. It, it was a lot of fun to whoop up on them boys, and I got to see that this year too. All right. Um, yeah, speaking of this year, what in, in your time talking to Sarkeesian, your time around Austin, training with Jeremy Hills and, and Tim Crowder, uh, have you gotten a chance to – Check in on on this uh, current Longhorns football team. I've been able to watch a couple practices. I've been there and I got to see these guys play. I like what I see. Uh, I'm always optimistic though because I I see it as a player mindset. Like like these guys put in the work. Coach Beckton has them in the weight room working hard. Um, you know I was with Bo Davis, so I know he's gonna have a great interior group. Um, I think these young pass rushers are going to be do well. And I'm excited to see what happens with the quarterbacks between Hudson Card and uh, Quinn Ewers. Like, I think we have a, a unique situation that we haven't had in a while where you got two good quarterbacks. You really can't. I don't think you can go wrong with either. Okay, I'm going to go back to the pass rushers for a second. You said two young or some young pass rushers. Are you referring to Baron Sorrell and – Justice Finkley or who 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 stood out to you? You can even give me numbers. I'll fill in the rest. Man, I actually don't know what numbers. I was just watching them in practice. Like I wasn't looking at numbers. I don't know their names. It's, I'm sad. I'm embarrassed to say. But um I just think that we it looked like I I who did I talk to? Colborn. I talked to uh Andre. Yeah, I talked to Keandre and he was telling me like he said they were young. Now do they have older guys on the, the DN? I mean, Ovi Gofu is the Notre Dame grad transfer, but all the other guys are young. I mean, it's okay. Aaron Sorrell, Prince Dorba from from uh, from Dallas, yeah, and, and Justice Finkley's the early enrollee freshman who looks like he's a third year player <laughs> for sure. So I, that's what I thought. I didn't know anything about him. I didn't do any research, which unfortunately I didn't normally I do, but I've been a little busy. Uh, but I was just watching, and I just. Seeing young guys move like they do and they can get out and go. I'm going to watch the spring game today, but uh, it's fun to see. It's fun to see because I was a young guy at one time. Didn't just played. I just ran, just threw moves. Didn't 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 play the chess game of pass rush. Um, but it, yeah, those guys, those guys to me look good. I feel like they can be good. Hopefully, I'll get a chance to like chat with them. If they want to come and, and do some work with me, uh, maybe when I work with Tim or just one-on-one -on -one stuff or whatever, I'd be down. If that's if that's even legal, I don't know how that works. But <laughs> I think everything's legal now. You know, in the <laughs> age of nil, everything anything goes. For sure, I I never wanted to mess with those guys unless I unless I knew it was okay. Um, and I might for any of these younger guys that come to Texas, like hit me up, like. Well, we can chat whenever. What's it like, Jackson, looking back? Because everyone wants to know what it's like um, at Texas and and even why Texas hasn't been as, you know, relevant in the last decade as they were in the first decade of the 2000s. And what do you think it is? Because Moro Ajomo kind of talked about this. I think Steve Sarkeesian got a little upset that he talked about it, that – you know, there's sort of a, an ingrained culture that you have to fight against to keep everyone on edge, to, to build that winning uh, mentality. Um, the former athletic director here, DeLos Dodds, uh, used to tell his coaches that Austin can make your players soft, so make sure that you guard against that. What What is it you think that that uh, has to change or or that, you know, Texas football is lacking right now? It's hard to come in this place. I think just getting an offer from here, from Texas, is such a big deal. It's like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to Texas. Like, And some people, that they think that they have arrived. They think that they have got – It's that's the height of where they want to go. And they're like, oh, yeah, I want to go to the NFL too. But it's like, well, if you want to go to the NFL, like, cool. I got an offer from Texas. Now I got to be great at Texas. Let's get better each year, like improve, improve, improve. And a lot of people get too content coming here. 
people are – we're here in Austin, we're seen as these superstars. We're the professional team. And some people get drunk off of that. They just – they just buy into all the praise that they're given. And then when they get all this negative talk, you're not good. You're not this. You're not that. They get bitter and shut off. And then they're like, "What? I, I don't know what I what I believe. And a lot of people, I just think that guys need just to get back to work. You haven't arrived. Uh, you never arrive. You're always trying to improve. And... Be the best you can be. Drop your egos at the door. Like, let's be a team. I think that's the biggest thing. And I think that's been what what a lot of problems have been. Um, you just got to realize, like, just because you're at Texas doesn't mean you're the shit. And say, excuse my language. Um, you have to put that work in to be that guy. Everybody has to put that work in. And we got to continue. I don't care if you're a starter, backup, third string, for whatever, walk on, like put that work in. Like, that's what Texas is known for, be working hard. Like I talked to all the guys that won, won the Natty, and they worked hard. They worked their butts off. And just talking to older guys at certain times, some guys knew like, hey, we're not going to have a good year this year because we didn't work like we, we worked the year before. We're excited because we went to the national championship, but we didn't win. So why are we not working harder? What, what, uh, let's go, let's go down memory lane for a second. Then we're going to play some Jackson Jeffco trivia. For sure. Um, who was the best player you played with at Texas? The best player. That's a tough question. That is a really tough question. Um, cause I played with some guys, some really good players. Um, I know Quandra would be mad if I didn't say him, but I'm not going to say him <laughs> just because I like to mess with him. <laughs> he was a beast, though. I love it. Um, best player. It's hard because, like, when you say best players, a lot of times you want to go with like a skill skill position. Yeah, but I played with some guys that just are. Incredible. Man. That's a rough one. Uh, who's, okay, let me – while you're thinking about that, who's uh, the the toughest player you went up against while you were in college? The toughest player I went up against, he was a young guy, actually. Uh, do you know, remember Laramie Tunzel? Yeah. I went against him at Old Miss. He had some of the best feet out of a tackle that I went against. Uh, he can move. He really could move, and I, he was good. He what? Was really good. What do you remember about your interception off Tony Romo? What I remember about my interception? Okay, I'll run you through it. So it was a – I was supposed to be dropping in the coverage. Now they play action. So I came up and played like it was run, and I saw the back leak out of the corner of my eye. And so, like, they call it, oh, shit, tempo. It's like, oh, shit. And I turn and just spin and run to him. And Tony Romo doesn't see me, so he tosses it up. And so I'm turning, and as I turn to look back, the ball is right up there. And I'm like, no way. <laughs> so I go and grab it. I'm like, oh, man, I just got this pick. I might score. So I turn because, like, uh, it was Joseph Randall who he's trying to throw it to uh, who played at Oklahoma State. Yeah. I'm like, oh, he's not going to get me. And so he like shoelace. I try to spin out and dive and get out of his, and I I fall. Um, and I was like, no, I was about to score a pick six because no one was catching me if I got out of that. But it's funny because Keenan Robinson was on the Redskins with me, so you can see him in the back of the the video, being like, like pitch it, pitch it. I didn't have enough time to pitch it. He's like, why didn't you pitch it to me, Jeff Coat? I was like, I didn't have enough time to pitch it. I'm trying to get loose and spin. Like, I didn't even get – like, I caught it. I spun. And by that time, I was getting tired. I love it. Why did you pitch it to me? <laughs> All right, let's 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 play some some Jackson Jeffcoat trivia. You are top five uh, 
in a single season for sacks. Okay. Do you remember how many sacks you had in 2013? 13 and a half. All right. So far, so good. Okay. I got it so right. So go. good, Jackson. All right. You are number seven in career sacks at Texas. Do you know what that number is? I It's either 27.5 or 26.5. 27.5. That's what I'm talking go. about. All right. And you are number five um, all time for – or sorry, number five, single season for tackles for loss. Ooh, that's going to be a tough one. Do you remember how many tackles for loss you had in 2013? If I had to guess, 45? 22 that season. Oh, without the uh, that season? Yeah, that season. Without not the career, the just the single season. Oh, okay. 22 22 do you, do you realize lot. jackson we there hasn't been anyone with 22 tackles for loss in a season are you serious since, since you you're kidding me no, we got to change that we got to change that we i thought my boy joseph osai was gonna catch my sacks or charles and Minahue. yeah osai had 16 and a half in a season uh but not 22 <laughs> my friend so all right so you're going back to winnipeg yes sir because they let you bring the gray cup to texas so i signed the paper new new contract yes sir all right well man i i love the conversation um love talking ball with jackson jeff coat uh give my best to your dad and Good luck with the commercial real estate. Tell everyone again uh, where they can find you in commercial real estate. Yeah, I work for Cantero Real Estate Group. Um, Cantero, C-A-N-T-E-R-O? R-A. R-A. Cantero. Cantero. Okay, Cantero Real Estate. Yeah, C-A-N, C-A-N-T-E-R-A. Cantero Real Estate Group here in Austin. Um, again, my partners are Whit Westbrook and Bo Ricks. Um but yeah, we uh we're doing some big things here in Austin. It's gonna be fun. And if anybody needs any help with uh can our commercial real estate needs, like hit us up. Yeah, you and Case McCoy doing commercial real estate. Yeah. Any other I interned at Case's um his brokerage. Okay. So I've been there before too. They got a really good shop as well. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Jackson, man, congratulations on the Grey Cup, your second. And uh, keep up the, the good work. Best of luck with everything. And uh, let's uh, stay in touch. We'll stay in touch. Chip, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate you. All really. right. For, for Jackson Jeffcoat, I am Chip Brown. Until next time, we'll see you over at Horns247.com. Until then, uh, stay safe and keep the faith.